So, let's take some questions. I like questions. What do you guys got? Hey everybody, it's Dave. I'm back with episode number four already of uh, The Maker Zone. Really happy to be back. The questions are now kind of pouring in over LinkedIn, Core, and Twitter, so I'm really happy about that. We've gotten really constructive, good feedback from a lot of you. And um, we gathered a theme from uh, last time and this time together. Last time we covered more investing and finance, um, how do you go about wealth management. And this time we got a lot of questions about robo-advisory. So I want to take that head on because I get about asked about this a hundred times a week um, in every channel and conversation I'm in. So we'll take that on. Uh, Phil, do you want to fire away? Yeah, Johan asks, what are robo-advisors and will they replace independent financial advisors? Johan asks, what are robos and will they replace independent? So IFAs, as it's known in the industry. Um, robo-advisory, to go way back to the start. I mean, I'm, I'm also new to this. I started looking at robo-advisors um, when they first started to really spin off and get press and traction in 2011 and 12. Um, and you know some of the first ones we looked at are very different from today. The industry is a little bit evolved. Um, what we know is that there's many hundreds of robos that have already come to the market or are about to, and there's many different strategies within that, and I hate the word robo, um, and I'll explain why. So if I could explain this to my mom, who's going to watch this video, I am sure, <laughs> um, <laughs> robo-advisory basically refers to uh, people trying to invest and getting really confused about what to invest in, and so they basically give up and they say, what would I invest in if I had the ideal kind of strategy and I knew what I was doing in investing? How can I do it really cheaply and effectively and still understand it and get a decent interaction with that investing? And that's kind of the basic play for robo-advisory since the past X years, um, but there's a lot of different offshoots of it. So we know a lot of the founders personally that we met over the years. Um, obviously, um, I, I know the SIGFIC guys, um, we talked to uh, the Hedgeable team recently. Um, we know the European scene as well in this. There's some consolidation going on in the scene right now, but basically um, I think there's, there's Robo done well and not. So for more industry insiders, we're also going to be watching this from FinTech. It's not Robo, it's automated portfolio replication using ETFs and usually done without own research. So many of the smaller companies trying to do it um, you know, are, are really leveraging someone else's research and shelf to do it, which means they're too targeted on one thing. So they may grab Vanguard shelf or PIMCO shelf or Fidelity shelf, and now the robos are getting bought by those same companies. Um, and so I think in the end, will they take over the banking world as we know it? No, they won't. Um, and, you know, I'm as much of a fintech supporter and sponsor as anyone else. Um, but I think over the years, what we've seen is that the trust issue is still at the core of the thing. You can have a great brand. Um, I mentioned TransferWise in, in episode one. Their brand is fantastic. When you think about transfers today, if you're under the age of 30, you probably think of that first before you think of Wells Fargo. Um, and, you know, for, for me, it's going to be interesting whether uh, Betterment, Personal Capital, uh, Nutmeg are the things you're thinking about when you're a millennial investing in 10 years or whether those brands will have been subsumed by the industry who buys up those services because basically it isn't a lot of patenting as I covered in episode two that I'm seeing. It's mostly um, a great UX, a front end, and going the last mile to the customer and making it much easier to get started investing. But as a professional level investor, if you've got more than a certain level of uh, hundreds of thousands of francs, I don't think it's sufficient from my perspective personally to do all your investing comprehensively. So that's kind of my comprehensive love-hate for robo-advisors and um, I talk with, with many of the teams and I kind of know the traction level and um, you know I think it's going pretty well for a lot of them so it's good. What other questions do we have today? But before we, before we get into that let me, let me jump on uh, with this as well. So from my perspective as a 20-something as a right and you mentioned as a millennial um, you're looking at different options you know what can I do in the markets and you're thinking to yourself like I think, I think for me it's like what is the apple of uh, investing or what is the apple of tax advice or et cetera, et cetera. So if I look at this, I'm like, um, what do we call robo advisors? That, that space, what do we call that? It's basically automated portfolio replication. Okay. Whatever that means because a couple yeah, of years ago I had no idea what that means and my friends don't either. So I would say what is the apple of uh, automated uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I think to myself, okay. Future advisor or nutmeg or um, personal capital, something like that. And I always look for okay, what is going to be the easiest UX, the easiest UI, and that's how I think 
my generation and Phil and, and my friends will go about uh, their investments now and how they manage their money. So it's just what's easiest, what's going to save me the most time and what can I jump into like that. So That's a really good perspective. Yeah. And, and when it comes to, I, I thought about this because I was reading through the question before. Um, I think the question was, uh, the end of the question was, what do you think will happen to independent financial advisors? And I think that's where something like a marketplace, like what we're doing with Wino, is going to be really helpful because at the simple level, you can use Future Advisor or Nutmeg or Personal Capital, but when you need that more, yeah, complex advice, then you're probably going to need someone who knows, yeah, you can talk to face to face or over the phone who really knows what they're doing and have experience or has experience. So, in in that case, I think you do need an independent. Uh, IFA, um, but how do you get that? And I think I'm lost right now how I can get an independent financial advisor, and that's where something like Wino comes into play. And I can choose, okay, something like TripAdvisor, something like, um, yeah, something like a TripAdvisor where I can just pick and choose and see ratings, blah, 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 um, because that's what I'm used to. So, Phil, do you have a perspective on this? Or? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Like we're we live in a transparent... Hey, behind <laughs> the camera. Um, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think you're right um, about the transparency that is important because we're used to a much more transparent world, digital environment where we source our information um, online. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Good. We'll have to bump it down again. Awesome. Good, good perspectives from you guys. Um, I, I didn't introduce these guys properly. On episode one, I kind of said they were sitting over in the corner, but obviously we work together, and I learn more from them than they learn from me on a daily basis. That should be clear <laughs> to everybody by now. Um, Nick basically is working on Minome, as is, as is um, Phil, and um, you know Phil's launched his own company in the past. Nick is our... He's basically digitized Wynome for us, so he's in, in, in contact with many, many people, and um, he's doing an awesome job. Um, also understanding RoboAdvisor. I didn't know you knew that much about Robo. <laughs> he's actually a football player, a professional one. I mean soccer for the Americans who are watching this. You know, football to the rest of the world. So, yeah. <laughs> another question. Come on. Uh, we've got another question from Georgia. Uh, what's your favorite RoboAdvisor and why? All right, I'm not going to pick Giorgio. I'm not going to pick a favorite robo advisor, but I think certain of them have some really strong strengths, right? I mean, if you look at uh, Zigfic, their thing has been Mike's team has done excellent partnerships, and he did them many years ago. So if you're replicating your portfolio and testing it out on a virtual basis over FT or Wall Street Journal, he's got so many partnerships lined up, and many people are accessing his product on a white label basis and don't even know it, and it's a pretty solid looking product. Um, if you're living in the UK and you're using Nutmeg already or if you're thinking about it, you know, the team behind that, we know them and it's like a very interesting thing and especially what Nick just described, right, if you just want it to become super easy. But I do think that there's, you know, limitations to the model in terms of, um, you know, once you have, let's say, multiple ESAs, as they're called, so individual savings accounts in the UK, and you've got pension accounts from X firms that you've been at, and you already have existing investments to onboard with your next set of advisory, and you have to plan for your second house and your kids' education, it starts to get a little difficult, and you find yourself in Excel on the weekend on Saturday morning trying to figure that all out. And that's basically where a financial um, advisor starts to come in, or an IFA, what you described it before, Phil. And I think that's, you know, the models in Robo um, will start to merge towards that and integrate that in the models. Personal Capital already offers you direct access to the advisor. I'm not plugging them or whatever, but, you know, that was something that Bill's team obviously thought about from the start because they're coming more from the banking industry and not trying to disrupt it as much as they are trying to renovate it. Um, but I'm not going to try to name a best Robo advisor. I think there's all these interesting plays on it, right? Wise Banyan goes younger with Herbert and his team. Um, some of the simpler models in the U.S. also try to go for the, you know, LearnVest does the education first and targets millennials as well. And I think each has picked up kind of a niche and a name for themselves. And they're all doing an excellent job. The entrepreneurs are for real and they're working their ass off. And I think it's, it's fantastic to watch them grow as well. So, you know, I'm trying to play the middle ground. I'm working at a big institution and at the same time have a really good understanding of what's going on up there and I think they're both doing doing well. So one more question on 
What's our theme of the day, Robo? We've got one more question from Christian uh, on Twitter. Yeah. Um, who helps me to understand if my investments really impact the values I consider relevant in addition to financial risk and return? So it's about values in addition to risk and return from yeah. Christian. Yeah. Um, complicated question. Um, if you look more, I'm going to stay in startup mode as the fintech today because we started that way with Robo. <laughs> um, if you look towards research-based themes, right? If you look at Motif, um, who's invested by, I think, J.P. Morgan and Goldman at this point. Um, Motif, and I think it's Hartik and team, have done an awesome job just targeting in on, you know, new drugs, um, water, um, you know, AIDS is a global epidemic, uh, developing countries, whatever, and they target in and say, how do you want to invest in that? And that goes back to your values, which is the question around what, what Christian asked, um, what do I believe in? Because that's what I want to invest in. And I think a lot of the younger folks, Nick, you tell me, because you're like 45 years younger than me. <laughs> like, I think a lot of the younger folks really believe in that. I mean, I've always believed in it, but it's super difficult to invest in just green energy, right? Um, and then balance that across your strategic allocation, as, as we call it. So how you allocate your assets across. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about it? Do you invest in what you believe in? Yeah, look, I think... I think it's, it's difficult for me to say just because I'm kind of entering that space now. I got a more uh, regular job, so I'm earning more money, blah, blah, blah. So I will be earning, yeah, I'm earning a more yeah, sustainable income, stable income, and I will um, get some liquidity, whatever. So, yes, I think, I think for our generation, it's like you really have to believe what you're investing in. Um, and like what I said before, it has to be simple to do. So like what Motive does, Motive, Motive. it's like super easy to use. It's like, it's like you just put your money there and then, you know, you see where it goes. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that's where that's going. What else could you say? You know, what's interesting is that a lot of the banks have this, but it's split up amongst multiple departments and interest zones within a universal or a bigger bank or even a private bank. So you might have an impact investing team, which is where you have impact on society through your investing, or sustainable investing team, or you know, kind of the green energy zone, and that might be trapped within the funds or asset management department. And to even put that together as a client is super difficult, or even a client advisor trying to assemble it for a client. So investing based on your values and then tying that into your strategic wealth planning and your overall asset allocation um, can be challenging. And then you have to figure that many people work across many institutions. The example I used before where you might have a pension fund here and an individual savings account, a 401k plan in the U.S. if you're used to that terminology. And to put all of that onto one page, which is the consolidation wave also from FinTech, of how do I put all this on one page and make sense out of it, makes a lot of sense for people in terms of investing in their value. So, um, super good question, and I appreciate it. 100%, like 100%, but that's really true. A client, a client advisor themselves don't know uh, what products that the, the bank has available, then it's like for someone like me, who, and, and most of our generation, when I leave the house, I have this in my hand. When I come home, I have this in my hand. And the whole day, I'm trying to find the fastest way, the best way to find the information, right? So this comes down to the simplicity, simplicity thing. Like, it has to be simple to use. And banks or whoever is making some sort of financial product, um, they have to simplify it down into something that I can understand. But also, like, as a in a very human um, human language and all this banking terminology and stuff like that's just that's just my observation as, as, as someone who's really getting to know more about the banking industry and and something Phil you I'm sorry you see as well Phil because Phil has started the last uh, a few weeks with us and prior to that he didn't know much about banking um, and and now you see yourself like how complicated all these different things can be, right? And yeah, simplification. How do you simplify? That's I think that's the question that these banks, when they're targeting towards millennials, they have to they have to think about. I have to give a shout out to the sort of what is it at this point? Two and a half billion millennials on the planet because <laughs> People are accusing falsely millennials of being lazy. I don't know many millennials who are lazy, and I've got a lot in the team. And as you can see, as we used to say back in Boston, he's wicked smart. 
So I think um, it's about simplification, like you said, and it's about getting to the banking experience and making it much easier for people to comprehend and use than it is already today. And that's what fintech's been trying to do, and that's what all the bankers are trying to do, by the way, as well. So there's no bad guys in this scenario, either in robo-advisory or portfolio replication or anywhere else that I've seen. So. Thanks. Really good interaction, you guys. Thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. We like it. And See you again. Um, for that day, oh. one more thing. So, our plan for the next episode is that we go on a kind of tour of Zurich. We could show people around. So, please, if you want Dave to, um, what, visit places, Phil? Or yeah, I think visit places, go around Zurich. I think we've got already a few questions regarding Zurich. So who wants a walking tour of who wants a walking tour? The, the ground zero of private banking, kind of where it all started. Who wants a walking tour of that? Give me a thumbs up or a like and give and us some questions. Use the hashtag. Put it here. Dave on tour. Dave on tour, hashtag. Um, ask your questions. So. Yeah, walk around Prada Plus a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Sounds cool. See you next time. Thanks.